If you don't have too much time for studying and memorizing openings, you'll appreciate a solid, sound and reliable opening system. The one in which you always know your plan, no matter what your opponent throws at you. This video is exactly about it, highlighting the English opening. What you see on the board is typical development of White's pieces in the English. It is not the only available setup, but this one can be applied in nearly any scenario and is relatively straightforward to grasp. Let's start by asking about our plan based on the pawn structure. It is this chain that tells us what to do. It's pointing towards the queen side, and the typical English opening plan is to opt for rook b1, b4, and further expansion on this flank. It goes together with an idea to exploit the long light square diagonal controlled by the g2 bishop. Overall, by choosing this plan, we do according to the general guideline which suggests to play on the side where we have more space. In the English, thanks to the first move c4, for white it is the queen side. The most popular reaction of black is e5. And almost regardless of what they do, our first piece to develop is the b1 knight. Black continues to develop normally and we bring our bishop to the long diagonal, coordinating with a c4 pawn. Then we can see in this game, played by Laskier, white opted for d3 and then played bishop d2. And this is a slight deviation from the main move order, since usually we play knight f3 first and castle. However, this does not change much or anything, because after black castled, white continued with knight f3. In the game we are following, black opted for the move knight d4. And analyzing this game, Alechin said, that this move aims to free up the c7 pawn to advance to c6 and fight for the d5 square, which is typically controlled by white in the English. Laskier castled, and indeed c6 was played by black. This move also supports d7 d5, which white wanted to indirectly stop by playing rook c1. The engine likes this move because it's necessary, but typically this rook goes to b1, supporting b4. In this case, b4 can be played without any additional support. Black took on f3, bishop takes f3, then bishop h3, rook e1, queen d7, and finally b5. This moment in the game perfectly shows the point of white's queenside expansion and initiative. Black does not feel comfortable on c6, while in case of d5, b takes c, b takes c6, and queen a4, it becomes evident that white continues to apply pressure on the queen side and along the central diagonal. In the game, we had a different approach as black played c5. Now, this creates a serious weakness on d5 and the light squares, and once again you can see how well white bishop coordinates with a c4 pawn in controlling the critical d5 square. Now, white should have opted for a4, a5, completely seizing control of the queen side. But we had an interesting move knight e4 instead. The idea is to prevent the move h6, which black really wants to play, to prevent bishop g5 and bishop takes e7, since that knight is defending the d5 critical square. Additionally, h6 supports g5, and this is important for black's counterplay, which is only possible on the king side. And now, in case of h6, white can simply take it, as there is a knight f6 fork. On the other hand, the move like f5 does not work due to knight g5, hitting the important light square bishop. Black played queen c7 instead, and after rook b1, the move h6 was finally possible. However, it seemed as black is really lacking a good plan, opting for bishop d7. So white prevented h6 by playing queen c1. Black couldn't afford to keep their queen tied down babysitting the b-pawn, so they played b6. This move transforms the pawn into a hook, making a4, a5 even stronger. But Lasker saw something better. With the a8 rook x-rayed by the light square bishop, arises the chance to play bishop g5. In case of f6, 
Knight takes f6, bishop takes f6, bishop takes a8, rook takes a8, and bishop takes f6, white is winning. Black played knight f5, then knight f6 check, bishop takes f6, bishop takes f6, rook a b8. What white needs is to bring the queen to h6, therefore bishop g4, knight g7, queen h6, knight e8, and bishop e7, leaving black at least an exchange down with a completely lost position. Seems so easy and straightforward. Now, let's quickly see another example. The game played by Ulf Anderson and Yasser Serva. White opened with knight f3, which is another route to reach the English opening, potentially. However, unless you also have the ready opening in your repertoire, I suggest strongly to stick with the c4, as it prevents the option of d5. This time we can see black opting for c5 instead of e5, and white stays on the course. Notice that white does not play d3 yet. This is because there is no immediate threat of e5, e4. And keeping the pawn on d2 means that there is no issue with the c3 knight in case the b pawn advances. This is important, especially when black fianchettas their bishop on g7. Playing d3 would have been only part of a protocol, something done out of obligation. The move a3, with an idea to speed up with a b4 plan, is really something I wanted you to see. So even though you have a clear idea of your overall setup, you shouldn't stick to it rigidly. Another reason I wanted to highlight this game is the moment when black plays a5. Whenever they have c5 in their pawn structure, the same plan white is implementing is something black can also attempt in their own camp, and it is fully supported by their pawn structure. However, after a5 is provoked, there is no more support for their b7, b5, leaving only white with the opportunity to develop an initiative on the queen side. And this is precisely facilitated by playing an early a3 and rook b1. Now we can see white provoking f6 and after bishop e3 and bishop e6, this is a good moment to pause and ask you to find a good plan for white to support expansion on the queen side. The maneuver starts with knight e1, followed by knight c2, and now we are ready for b4. It is a common theme in the English. But since the queen is no longer controlling the diagonal, black is able to advance a4. Question is, should we still opt for the pawn break on the queen side? Absolutely. Advancing the b-pawn is the natural continuation of white's plan, opening the b-file and coordinating with the g2 bishop. Now, except of the pressure along the b-file, there is another team in this position, the d5 square. By maneuvering the bishop to d2 and advancing a4, white sets the stage to reinforce control over d5 with the knight maneuver to e3. All that looks very nice, but what to do after knight b4? Seems like black is not only controlling d5, but also blocking the b-file with a single knight. Take some time to think and suggest your move in this position for white. Wolf Anderson was known as a great positional player and an expert when it comes to playing moves like rook takes b4. The compensation for an exchange is evident through control over the key d5 square. But there is no need to rush since black is not able to advance d5, while possible exchanges on d5 would benefit only black. So instead of immediate knight e5, white aimed to secure even greater control over the light squares and force the rook on a6, away from defending the b6 pawn, all by maneuvering the knight to b4. Although it was not really required, white saw that their opponent is paralyzed in the center, as well as on the queen side, and opted to stop any kind of initiative of black on the king side by playing h4. Only then knight bd5 was played, which actually secures capturing the b6 pawn at the end of the line. Notice how black is still without any clear idea of how and what to attack in white's camp. White's structure is so solid and all squares covered. Black decided to sacrifice a pawn in order to open the game. 
On the other side, it only centralizes white pieces. After queen a4 and rook b7, white is threatening knight f6 and queen takes h6. So black covered the 7th rank, but it left a d6 pawn hanging. Black is completely destroyed and after knight takes f5, Saravant finally resigned. In case you face the king's Indian defense setup, there are a couple of options you can use. If you want to play the king's Indian, that's perfectly fine, and it is a different team. But if you want to stay in the domain of the English, there is just one little thing to know. We develop as usual, prepare and play b4. When possible, we advance to b5, and then, when you see that your opponent is ready to trade the light square bishops, play rook e1, because it allows to pull the bishop back to h1 in this position, and that's very important, not only to keep putting pressure on the queen side, but also to protect your king later in the game. In case of e6 or c6, followed by d5, we're going to be out of the English opening for sure. It is the only way black can avoid the English, and play either the Reti, Slav defense, or Queen's Gambit. It is basically up to you. Most of the English opening players that I know opt for the simplest way in either of these two cases, which is to trade on d5 and advance d4, leading to the well-known Carlsberg pawn structure in the exchange variation of the Queen's Gambit. Or in case of c6, they just accept to play the exchange variation of the Slav defense. Either way, it doesn't take a lot of time to get to understand how to play those types of middle game. 